The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, Paul, you can jump right in. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our next uh, edition of Just Ask Paul. So I've got a, a series of questions from several diecasters, and several of these questions came in in, in the last several weeks. And uh, instead of just waiting to answer them on this, I contacted the diecasters and had a lot of dialogue. Uh, and I'll go through some of that. Some of that I'm allowed to share, some of that I'm not allowed to share, but we'll, we'll talk through it and then understand where the diecaster was at, what the problem is that they were having, and then what we did to help solve that problem. So jumping right into this, our first question is, we have a customer that is questioning whether the staining caused by dye spray accumulations on the surface are incorporated into and become harmful to the chemistry of the metal or its ability to be plated or coated. Has any research along such lines been done and what were the results? So this is one of the customers that, uh, one of the die casters that sent in this detail to me. And we, we had subsequent uh, question answer uh, back and forth and they provided me a lot of data that I asked for and once I started seeing that data, we could then start to actually determine what the root cause of this condition was and what the corrective actions were. So we're gonna break this question down into a couple pieces. The first piece is, you know, can spray become harmful to the chemistry of the metal? Well, and the reality is, can it be harmful to not only the casting and the casting mechanicals, but also the uh, subsequent processes and then the second part of that is, can excess spray cause plating or uh, painting issues? And then we'll look at some research. And, and I gathered some technical documents on that, and I'll share those with you. So to start out with, um, we, with this particular diecaster, I just started talking about, hey, you, do, you know, let's let's first understand the basics so that we have some some level playing field. So we understand what we're supposed to do and what we're not supposed to do. So the first thing is when we're spraying, we just need to make sure that we don't have spray running off the tool and, and we want to spray the minimum amount on the die. And then the last part of this, this particular slide is we want to understand the wetting temperature of our die lubes. So when does our die lube wet out? At what temperature? So if we have an ejection temperature, and I'm going to pick a number of 550 degrees Fahrenheit and our wetting temperature is 400 degrees Fahrenheit, that means we need to cool that tool down until the tool reaches the wetting temperature. That's the point that the lube actually starts to deposit on the die surface. So, and that's important with this kind of a problem once we start discussing it. So understanding spray, spray amounts. Then we talked about spray techniques and made sure that we have uh, good spray techniques that we're spraying the entire area of the tool, that we have uh, water cooling, because frankly, spray is not there necessarily to cool the tool. Its function is to coat the tool and to make sure that we have that coating. So the next time we inject metal into our die cast die, the metal doesn't stick or, or burn on to the die surface. Um, so we want to make sure that we have good spray techniques when we're putting this on the tool. And then we want to understand, you know, we can see the casting. So here's just a picture of a, of a casting and, and we can see that excess lube and that excess lube can cause gas porosity. So these are going to be liquids that are left on the face of the tool. Uh, when that liquid's there, if it's still present, when the metal hits it, you know, it's going to turn into gas. It's going to increase in volume. 15, 1600 times. And so we're gonna have trapped gas in our casting if we have excess lube. Uh, the next item is shrink porosity. Now we don't think about shrink porosity when we're looking at dye spray, but, but if we are affecting the dye surface temperature and, and we remember that the last location to solidify it is gonna be prone to some shrink porosity and we call it the neutral thermal axis. And we're looking at dye design and we calculate, hey, where are those last zones to solidify? And we're either using our simulation package or actually doing this uh, calculation. We can calculate 
where are the last places to solidify and when that metal solidifies near the surface we're going to end up with shrink porosity near the surface of the die casting so this last location to solidify is very important to understand and, and to know that it can actually create defects near the surface of the casting if that shrink is near the surface so this is a die casting now this is not the casting that I was working with this particular die caster on but this casting uh, was from last summer uh, another problem at another caster and this is a very similar condition so we can see this particular casting we cut it we mounted it we started doing some uh, photomicrographs of the casting and we can see a lot of different porosity but what I want you to focus on are these two zones so these two zones are, are actually exhibiting shrink porosity near the surface of the casting and if I were to show you the actual other photomicrographs of this casting or the other casting I was working on we can see micro fissures near the surface now those micro fissures are there because this casting in this area is solidifying near the surface so this surface is running very hot and we're solidifying from this side of the casting this way and when we solidify near the surface we get end up with shrink porosity but when we end up with shrink this particular casting that i'm showing you actually had shrink voids and then during ejection we would develop a crack so we would see this surface separation or this crack in the casting and what was physically happening is we had this large shrink void the surface wasn't completely uh solid because this was the last place to solidify and we would then crack into that shrink void so that is the condition that i was seeing with this caster and and so we talked about you know looking at our dye temperatures making sure that we have you know good blow off and, and that we're going to minimize the porosity by minimizing our spray patterns so with this caster they then looked at the dye surface temperature and uh, actually change their spray pattern to move that neutral thermal axis back into the casting so we uh, cooled that surface looked at our internal cooling our dye spray and, and then made sure that we move that neutral thermal axis back into the casting giving us a good surface to solidify against and to stop any shrink voids near the surface of the die casting other conditions we need to be aware of our thermal fatigue so every time the die cycles we're going to see this large thermal gradient and that large thermal shock can lead to heat checking and if it continues and it's a large gradient a large thermal gradient we can start to see gross cracking in the die so other things that i discussed with this particular uh die caster were uh, heat checking and then we talked about dye buildup. Um, you know, the lubricants that we're using, the dye lubes, <clears throat> designed to break down at specific temperature ranges. So the lower the dye temperature, that's going to cause the lube to actually remain on the surface of the tool. And when that lube remains and it doesn't actually create the coating and then come off every time, it's going to build up over time. So that residue can actually get onto the casting it contaminate the casting causing some of that discoloration so we, we look at that as excess dye spray and then it can actually cause flow defects and other defects in the dye castings so we need that spray to prevent the molten metal from soldering and, and frankly if we get excessive we get porosity and other problems um, but we need to make sure we minimize that spray and protect the steel at the same time so we see this kind of staining when we get that excess dye spray and we frankly we just want to make sure whether we're doing manual or automatic dye spray that we keep that to a minimum i included this just so everybody here would, would just have a quick view of different lubricant related problems and solutions so porosity and blisters you know too much dilute the die is running too hot uh, cold shut chill on the die face uh, cavity buildup die solder traction drags 
Once again, all of these things are lube related or can be lube related. And so understanding our dye lube, understanding our wetting temperature, our spray pattern, and if we're getting shrink and we're getting some surface separation, some cracks at the surface, examining those under a microscope, taking photomicrographs is a great way to determine the type of porosity, shrink or gas. And if it is shrink, then looking at why is that shrink occurring there? You know, how do we move that shrink so that it, we, it's not near the surface of the casting and it's not going to give us any surface separations? So as a quick summary, you know, we have to have that dilube. The dilube is a, is a barrier you know, to prevent the aluminum from soldering. Uh, it does give us some external cooling. Internal cooling isn't always effective and we can spray hot spots in the tool. We need to understand the wettability and, and frankly, thermal management is critical to the casting process. Okay, also understand that dye spray has a cost associated with it. So if we have lube that is just uh, flowing off the tool, where we've got the garden hose effect and we're just spraying and it's just all running into the pit, that has a cost. It's not giving you anything because we can uh, minimize that spray and still achieve the same amount of cooling. The cooling is what we're after. We want to make sure we're using atomized spray. Uh, I, I did some stuff on spray uh, several episodes ago, but you can look those up or contact me and I can tell you about pulse spray or other types of spray opportunities. So the last part of this question was, you know, can excess spray cause plating or painting issues? And, you know, frankly, the short answer is yes. Um, the, the long answer is the, the chemistry of the dye and plunger lubricant can affect any post coating operations you know, from painting to chromating to plating. So if you're using those lubes and you're, you're going to change to a new lube, make sure you're doing paint trials, make sure you're doing coating trials, chromating trials, so that you know what effect a change in lube, the lube type, the lube chemistry, and how that's gonna affect your subsequent operations for your die castings. Here's some material. I'm going to leave this on the screen for a minute. Anybody that wants this can contact me and I can email these papers to them. But we've got papers um, going from about 1966 all the way up to uh, 2015. And all of these have to do with dye lube and the effects of dye spray on the dye castings, all the way to this last paper, which I found uh, rather good read on simulating the approach to predicting surface shrinkage, which is pretty much what this particular die caster was experiencing. We were experiencing shrinkage voids on the surface of the die casting. Okay, moving on to the next question. Uh, this reads, I have a question about the difference between thixo molding and thixo casting. I have considered that both are the same semi-solid concept. Heat the alloy until semi-solid stage, just with the difference that thixo molding is the name when magnesium is considered and thixo casting is for aluminum. Well, that's partially correct in, in that thixo molding is exclusively used for magnesium, but we'll talk about why. So when we're talking about thixo molding and thixo casting, they are very different processes. Thixo molding are processes that use that uses small magnesium buttons and a machine that resembles a, a, a plastic injection screw type machine. Thixo casting is we're using a pre-made billet. We're heating that billet just below the liquidus temperature so that it's semi-solid. And then we're injecting that semi-solid material into the die cast die. Let's get into this a little bit further. When, when we're talking about semi-solid casting processes, we basically have three processes. And that is thixo casting, Rio casting and thixo molding. So thixo casting is a billet process using aluminum alloys. Rio casting is using a liquid on demand, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes, but it's also using aluminum alloys. And then thixo molding is only using magnesium alloys. So when we look at the thixo casting process first, we're taking a material, uh, an ingot, 
we are melting that, electronically stirring that using an induction coil, and then we're creating another billet. This billet is then cut into pieces. So we make a, a semi-solid billet, we cut it into slugs, we then heat that slug. Once we heat that slug, we can heat it just to its semi-solid state. And when we reach that semi-solid point, it can actually be picked up if the robot gripper or whatever is loading that into the cold chamber, would actually put pressure on it, it could actually squeeze it because it's frankly got the consistency of butter or a very thick viscous material. It then gets put into a chamber and then injected into the die cast mold and creating a die casting. So there are several casters around the world still uh, making parts using this fixo casting process. So here's a fixo casting cell and this cell you know has a an induction style carousel heater where the billets are heated up they're then uh, a robot is used to actually load them into the chamber and then they're injected into the die cast machine for thick so molding so here's a picture of what a thick so molding machine would look like so this is a semi-solid metal processing process using magnesium chips so we have magnesium chips that are put into a feeder and they're then pushed into the machine using a screw type device. And then we have a heating device here just prior to them being injected. They're heated up to a slurry and then they're injected in their semi solid state into a die cast die. And, and frankly, with this process, you get good me mechanical properties. Uh, it's great for smaller parts, smaller components. The real cast process is, is using ingots. They're melting those ingots. Then they're solidifying the material to a semi-solid state and then casting the material. So there are as many as you know, 15, 16 different real casting processes. Uh, there's processes like uh, GISS and other processes that have similar characteristics um, but the, the idea is to uh, inject this stuff, you know, as a, as a semi-solid slurry into a die cast mold. You know, fixo molding, going back to fixo molding now, fixo molding is, you know, has been a, um, very successful commercially. Um, there are hundreds of machines throughout many companies worldwide. And this particular process with magnesium is mostly used with companies with no or very little liquid metal experience. So they, they can use solid pellets, they can uh, use a screw type machine, inject them into a mold and get out their castings, but they're not using a liquid metal at any point in the process. So some references on this are uh, papers that are on the NADCA technical archives, and I've included the technical number here with the uh, lead PI. So T10022 was done in 2010, T11082 was done in 2011, and then T06094 was done in 2006. But these particular papers would give you some more reference on fixo molding and fixo casting. Moving on to the next question. Well, this question gets into a, a little bit more technical detail. So the question says, my question is on the quenching of dye steel during the heat treat process. The specification states that it should be quenched at a 50 degree per minute at a very minimum, implying that quenching faster would be better. But I would imagine the faster you cool or quench, the greater the differences between the outside of the block and the inside of the block. Is there a maximum that the inside outside temperature differential that matters? Or is the heat transfer through the steel fast enough that you won't realistic, realistically ever see a big temperature difference that would cause an issue? I've also heard of steels cracking during quenching if it isn't done properly. So I'm curious if there are guidelines, heat treat guidelines, 
uh, that the heat treat facilities follow. So let's just jump into this. I'm, I'm, I've written in several sentences and then I've got a whole lot of detail behind this. So for quenching of dye steels, NACA recommends a 10 bar or higher vacuum furnace. You know, you're correct in your assumption that during the quenching of, this, of the steel from the austenitic phase to room temperature, the outside of the steel will cool faster than the inside of the steel. You know, however, that we're, the whole piece of steel is going to reach some martensitic structure. Okay, that martensitic structure, the actual uh, structure itself, is called face-centered tetragonal crystal shape. So that's the crystalline shape of the material after it uh, cools from its austenitic phase to its martensitic phase. Okay, the austenitic phase has a face-centered cubic shape. So that's the crystal shape of the austenite phase. There is going to be some retained austenite in the material. And that's primarily because when we're cooling a piece of steel in a uh, 10 bar or 20 bar vacuum furnace, we're going to cool that under pressure in a nitrogen environment, typically, or in an inert gas environment. And we have thermocouples. Those thermocouples are located on the outside of the steel and they're located on the inside of the steel. And, and the key to this is that we maintain or achieve a 50 degree per minute inside and outside. So although we want a rapid quench, you know, we want to make sure that the inside of the steel and the outside of the steel are, are getting a around the 50 degree per minute quench minimum. Okay. So we're going to get some transition and we're going to see primarily martensitic steel, but we're going to have some other types. We're going to have bainite. We may have some ferrite or cementite or, or perlite that, that may be in there also, but primarily this whole structure is going to be a martensitic structure. Uh, on the quench rate itself, you know, faster quench rates, you know, are, are good. So extreme fast quench rates are better. That is not the case. Okay. If, if we take our quench and we, we move it to 100 degree per minute quench, you know, it, it will not be worth the trade-off in distortion and residual stress that's going to be left in the steel due to an extremely fast or rapid quench. So although quenching at 100 degrees sounds good, it's not necessarily practical and it's not going to be good for the steel. Okay, and once again, we want to maintain a, a quench rate of 50 degree per minimum between the inside and the outside so that the entire piece of steel cools down. And, and your other comment about uh, the steel and the thermal transfer, steel has a very poor thermal transfer. So we the cooling is going to be done you know, due to the furnace itself. So let's do let's just go through a quick overview of heat treatment and uh, you know, what we're actually trying to achieve. So this is a iron carbon phase diagram. And this is, although it looks you know, pretty intimidating, we're going to break this down and we're going to just look at this region. So this phase diagram has temperature on this scale and it has carbon level on this scale. As you move to the right, the carbon level increases. As you move up the scale, the temperature increases. We're going to focus on this region only. So as we, we start to zoom in on that region, we have our percent carbon on this axis, temperature on this axis, and we're going to focus once again on this hypoeutectoid region. And as we look at that, when we take a piece of steel and we heat it up and we get past or around this 1800 degrees Fahrenheit, 1850, 1880, the entire steel then actually transforms into an austenitic um, structure. So that all of the steel, all the different structures dissolve, and we then achieve an entirely austenitic piece of steel. Okay, when we're dealing with tool steels, we are dealing with point. 4% carbon. So we're looking at this line only. 
So we now have our piece of steel and we're going to cool it down. So now as we cool it, things start to change depending on how fast we cool it and, and what we want to achieve. So as the austenite cools, as this piece of steel cools, it's going to transform into ferrite, perlite, and cementite, depending on the cooling rate. So once again, we're, we're looking at our cooling curve. If we cool rapidly, so we're at our 1,880 degrees, we're at 0.4% carbon, we're going to cool on this line from this point, and we're just going to cool it down. And when we look at these transition phases, as we cool it down rapidly, we're going to get a martensitic structure. Now, to give you another graph of this, how, how this works, if we take any piece of steel and we heat it up, and we heat it up to 1,880 degrees, okay, we're all right in that zone, the entire steel structure is going to turn to austenite. So we now have this austenite structure. If we cool it slowly, we're going to end up with ferrite or cementite or perlite. We're going to end up with some structure that's not necessarily good for die casting dies. But if we take austenite, we have this austenitic structure and we quench it rapidly, we're going to get this martensite. So, so why do we want martensite? Well, if, if we get this fast cooling, it gives us the hardest material, good strong material. It is brittle, and we're going to talk about that. It is martensitic and it has a small grain size. If we cool it slowly, it's softer. So instead of reaching a, a Rockwell, you know, 48 to 52, we're, we're going to be 35, 38 Rockwell. It's not as strong. So that's the toughness of the material. We want to rapidly cool to get high toughness. If we cool slowly, we're going to get less toughness. It is more ductile. Okay. And it is going to be primarily you know, ferrite, perlite, and cementite. And it's going to have a large grain structure. So we want to cool rapidly. And, and we want to make sure we quench that. So when we're quenching it, we have a controlled cooling process that's going to give us, it's going to harden the material. And it's going to give us a, a structure that's good for die cast tooling. When we cool it, we can quench it in water, in brine, in oil in air or pressurized air, and that's what we're doing when we're using our 10 bar furnaces. We're not putting it in water or, or brine or oil. You can quench in molten salt, you can quench in, in you know, molten sand. If you're using a, uh, a trim tool steel like A2 or O1, you're going to quench that in oil, and it's going to give you an extremely hard surface for trimming castings. So when we're doing our trim die cutters, it's very different than doing our die cast cavities. Okay, so graphically, um, what we want to minimize is distortion and cracking. So if we rapidly quench in these types of materials, we're going to have cracking, we're going to have distortion with the type of tool steels that we're dealing with. We want to air quench and we want to minimize distortion and cracking. There's going to be some distortion. We want to minimize it and we want to eliminate cracking. Uh, this is an IT curve or transfer transformation curve. I just wanted to show you this really quick, but this is how we cool steel. And, and then depending on at what point we actually hold and then quench it down to uh, room temperature and how much time it takes is going to help us transform that steel from its austenitic phase into its martensitic phase. So this is the martensitic phase. This is what it looks like under a microscope. And this is a, a low magnification and high magnification. But we, this is what we want. We, we want martensite. We, want, we, can, we can have some bainite, but primarily it's going to be a martensitic structure. I mentioned this at the beginning it is the, uh, the lattices, the, the crystal structure. And if we've got ferritic iron, uh, it's going to be a body centered cubic, austenitic is space centered cubic, and then this martensitic structure is what we want. That's going to be body centered tetragonal. It's important to understand because this structure has higher stresses. So as we heat treat a piece of steel, 
take a raw piece of steel and this is temperature and this is time and we heat it up we're going to preheat the steel we're going to hold at a couple points so we're going to heat it up and hold heat it up and hold and then we're going to heat it to its final temperature we're going to reach 1885 degrees for most tool steels we're going to hold that between 30 and 90 minutes then we're going to quench it okay so we hold it we completely transform any previous materials any any ferrite any cementite uh, any any material we actually put that back into solution we solutionize it and it becomes austenite once we achieve a fully austenitic structure we then quench it we, we're quenching at that 50 degree minute minimum okay so we get a rapid quench then we start doing tempers NACA rep recommends two tempers at a minimum uh, as a die caster I would like to see a third temperature temper and then a final hardness achieved after that third temper and then once we fully machine the casting or the die steel, we, we then do a final stress relief before we start making die castings. So this is a typical heat treat cycle for H13. You can read all of this in this publication, 207, 2018. Uh, it does a lot better job than I did today because uh, it's a lot more detail uh, in, in this particular publication. And you can get this publication and read about um, heat treating and quenching and, and what we want to achieve and why we want to achieve it. Okay, so this is available uh, for, for anybody to uh, obtain. Other things that you can look at are thermal design and control of die cast dies, um, temperature control uh, in die casting, and then you know, the die design and, and designing cooling lines and all of that into your die steel. So, some additional materials that you can also uh, look at. Our next question uh, is a pretty short answered question, but the question reads, I just want to know if anyone out there is using the pictured tongs below to lift dies. We have two different sizes now, and we're looking for a supplier that can certify these for us. Any suggestions would be appreciated. Well, these are the lifting tongs that they're talking about. So these, these tongs are being used to move around steel components. These scissor type tongs have limited lifting capability when you're looking at pieces of steel compared to complete die cast tools. But per the OSHA regulations, they've got to be certified just like any other lifting devices. Some pictures of some of these tongs. So these are the tongs that, that the individual was referring to, but these tongs can come in various shapes and sizes. Uh, for various applications. So for most die casting companies, they're either using lifting chains, certified lifting chains and that are per the OSHA standards or certified on a frequency, typically annually, um, or they're using lifting magnets that are once again certified. And um, the lifting chains and lifting magnets, they're gonna have a capacity of you know, anywhere from 2000 pounds to 6,000, 5,000, up to 25,000 pounds. So depending on the exact lifting device that's being used. So my recommendation would, would be to contact the manufacturer of these devices and either have them certify them um, or they can give you a vendor uh, that can actually complete that certification to the OSHA requirements. Our last question for the day is uh, reads, we have an issue that we are dealing with that is when we move liquid aluminum from the holding furnace to the machine, they have an open duct where the liquid goes from the holding furnace to the machine. After one cycle, a small portion of that metal becomes solid and remains in the duct for the following cycle, which also leaves more material until they reach a point after a few cycles that the duct is totally blocked and the duct needs to be cleaned. And, and they want to know, did I have any solutions for this condition? So just like a few of the other questions that I've received, I immediately contacted the die caster and, and we, we started discussing this particular problem because I want to understand what they mean by duct and, and, and frankly, how the metal transfer was taking place. 
So we had some dialogue and we started discussing, uh, you know, exactly what was taking place. And, and once I saw these photos, uh, quickly I understood that they're using some sort of a uh, furnace with an air pressure system. And there's uh, several different furnaces out there. And, and they're using a, what I call a launder, every die caster might call that a different device. This particular die caster called it a duct and they're using this piece once again i i've always called it a launder that the liquid aluminum then comes out of the furnace goes into the launder and then down into the chamber itself so their their problem is that the material is, is becoming solidified in that duct and then we talked about several solutions and they had already implemented some, and, and we'll, we'll go through each one of these that, that was tried. So the first thing they, they tried was just putting a flame underneath the duct or underneath the wander, and, and they then heated it up to try to keep the metal liquid, and frankly, that became a cleaning issue, a 5S issue, and they still ended up with some material that still remained solid in the launder itself from the furnace to the chamber. So they then looked at an electric heating device and, and they then put an electric heating device on the launder and they heated that up to around 450 degrees Celsius. Um, they then, uh, it, it did perform better, but there was it was not completely uh, foolproof in, in what was happening. So here's a picture of that heating device. And this is now electric heat from the furnace to the chamber itself. Um, so when I, I then discussed this with them, I, I talked to them about this type of a launder. Now this is what I've used in my past and it's worked very well for me. It didn't necessarily have to have this device on it, but this ceramic launder coming out of a uh, Spico Westhoven type furnace where we use air pressure, pump the metal out. We, we saw very little to no adhesion of the aluminum to the launder surface without any heating devices on there. So they, they tried the gas, they tried the electric resistance heating. Uh, one thing they then tried is they put air blow offs on the duct itself or on the launder and they then had this air system that they put in here to blow any flash out so here's a uh, a close-up of that and then here's a video of the metal coming out and, and you'll see the metal pump out and you'll see a small bit of material that still adhered. So you can see the small flash. They then used air to blow that out every time. So as a, as a summary, you know, one idea is to heat the launder using an electric system. Another one was, was to add the air blow off. Uh, the air blow off, frankly, is gonna create a 5S cleaning issue because that flash is gonna blow out and you're doing it every cycle. And, and with that flash blowing out every cycle, you're potentially going to have that blow everywhere around the diecast cell that then just has to be cleaned up. So with the heated system and potentially using a ceramic launder, fully ceramic that would then not allow or would slow or eliminate the uh, solidification of the metal to the bottom surface of the, the launder itself and uh, would eliminate this condition shot after shot after shot. And, and this is what I have done in my past. So I wanna thank everybody for coming today. And if you have any questions or anything that you wanna know or wanna just have discussions about, uh, you can send those questions in to me personally, 
or you can send them to the spreadsheet that Athena has uh, put out there. So I want to make sure that if you have those questions, you know, we'd be willing to take a look at those, have that discussion, and help you solve those issues. And I want to thank everybody for coming today. My email and phone number are listed below that you can contact me at any time. Thank you, Paul. So as Paul said, we're going to open it up for questions. There are a few ways that you can ask questions. Within your control panel, there is a text box. If you click within the text box, type your question and hit send, we will get that in on our end. The next thing that you can do is if you're calling in on a phone or if you have a mic set up, you can just click that little hand icon. We'll go ahead, call on you and unmute you and you can ask your question out loud. Uh, last but not least, please feel free to email address or to email us. Paul's email address is up on the screen right now. Just jot that down or you can just reply to your confirmation email. As always, if you think of a question um, for this just segment, please feel free um, to click on the link in the email um, about this webinar to just submit whatever questions you have. You can always just send them directly to Paul. Um, but we do have a nice little form set up as well so that you can just jump on there and submit those. Uh, so we're going to hang out on the line for a few minutes here and see if any questions come through. All right, I don't see any hands raised and I don't see any questions coming through. Um, a majority of you have Paul's contact information as you've been on these webinars before. Again, his contact information is also located on the page um, for Just Ask Paul. So please feel free to reach out to him if you have any additional questions, if you would like to share uh, this broadcast with somebody else within your company. Um, you can just jump on our website under technology. Um, there is a tab for Ask Paul, um, and all the previous recordings are located there as well. Uh, so with that, I want to thank everybody for attending. Paul, thank you for answering all the questions. Um, and we look forward to seeing you on another episode of Just Ask Paul. Thanks, guys, and have a great rest of your day. Bye.